serve a good, awesome, faithful God, don't we? Good to see uh, so many people up at the altar. I say that because sometimes I'm the only one. I need prayer. And other weeks, you know, a lot of people up here. It's great. We all have a need, and I'm praying for you that the Lord will minister as only he can to you because he's pretty good at being God. Last time I checked, you know, come on. He's good. He's faithful. He's so good. It's good to be uh, with us today. If you're watching at Pinehurst, too, we just want to welcome you. Thanks for joining us. Hello to Leet and Barb and those who are uh, gathered, able to watch us from the screen, or if you're watching at home, wherever you are, thanks for joining us. We are very grateful for your presence. Uh, we are in Romans chapter 12, uh, back into Romans. It's good to be back in town, be back in the saddle, as if it were, behind the pulpit uh, after our vacation a few weeks ago, and of course we were here last week, but uh, good to be back into the Word of God in uh, preparation this weekend for us this morning. I um, want to remind us as we get into Romans chapter 12, we'll only be speaking about the first two verses today, which is uh, quite a, uh, I don't know if I should say a mouthful, but you know, there's a lot in that. So that's why I'm only doing the first two verses. But we're reminded that Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Romans chapter 1 through 8, uh, mostly speaking here of what Christ has done for us and who we are in him by and through faith. And then the theme of this whole book is introduced there in the verses I just read. Chapter 1, 18 verses, uh, all the way through chapter 3, verse 20, uh, have to do with condemnation, our horrible, sick, sinful condition apart from God. It is far worse than you can imagine if you're just sitting here for the first time, perhaps, thinking, well, I'm not so bad of a person, but apart from God, we are completely regenerate and undone, undone. And there is an eternal punishment that awaits us but God in his love and in his mercy has provided a way through Jesus Christ upon that cross for which we are so thankful. Continues on from condemnation in chapter 1 and into chapter 3, from chapter 3, verse 21 through chapter 5 about justification, the provision of God's righteousness through the person of Jesus Christ. And then chapters 6 through 8 sanctification. This is the demonstration of God's righteousness as he does a work in we who believe by this Holy Spirit. He changes us and transforms us from the inside out. I thought there was water in this the other day. Somebody must have stole it on me. I'll just take that cup that's right there. Thank you. <laughs> this process of sanctification and then, as Pastor Josh wrapped up chapters 9 through 11, the restoration portion, Israel's reception of God's righteousness. Of course, uh, Romans 9 through 11, talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews were God's sovereign choice through whom the Messiah would come. The Jews rejected the Messiah, which is true to this day, with the exception of a few Messianic Jews. There are some who actually believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And the Gentiles, the rest of us, uh, who are non-Jewish by birth, we've been grafted into the family of God, much like a branch on an olive tree. Or you could probably picture in our own area, apple trees would probably be the illustration we would use. Uh, you know, you could have a tree there up in the, was it Wayne County? We're a very big grower of apples around here. And other places you go, and they could have a tree that began as one type, planted from a seed, and then you can graft other varieties into that tree that same tree. And we have been grafted in, you see, uh, like, much like that. The Jews are like the original branches that support us, and we should not be arrogant toward them in any way because they support us. We do not support them. There's an article, by the way, that I, I listened to this in early January, before we even started our Roman series. And, and while we were there, I, I listened to it on Breakpoint. And, you know, John Stone Street, he had a guest with him uh, for that particular one. I printed this article. There's about 10 copies out back. It's, it's about the church and anti-Semitism. 
and uh, specifically looking at a little bit of history and some things, but it's, uh, it might be of interest to you. I printed it for you there. But Paul's heart in those chapters and God's heart is that the Jews will be grafted back in and, and that we should remain humble, lest they, as they have been broken off because of unbelief, we too should be cut off. So we must honor them in our hearts, not lightly dismiss them, right, as having missed the boat. Well, they missed the boat, you know, and Jesus came 2,000 years ago and they rejected him. But we should continue earnestly in prayer for them that God will graft them back in as they were the original promise bearers. For, as I already said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first. It was theirs before it was ours, and also to the Greek. And that leads us today to Romans chapter 12, where we begin to see the life of the true believer. Uh, This is where application begins, the behavior of God's righteousness in his people. Back in January, when we began our study of Romans, I gave you a handout with a few different outlines for the book. Um, One was from John MacArthur, one was from the ESV Study Bible, one was from uh, Paul Johansson, who wrote a book and did some, uh, some cool stuff here, um, and some of that. So, so it goes on here. Uh, like, uh, as we transition into this, I want to just remind us of some of that outline as we begin to look at chapter 12. Um, like in other epistles that he writes, Paul deals with the doctrinal truths first, then he gets into how we ought to live, how we should live as believers, So that's where he's beginning to transition into that right here. Um, The ESV Bible, study Bible says, this is God's righteousness in everyday life, but from chapter 12 to 15, 13. Uh, Talks about it as the practical implications of God's saving mercy. In other words, in light of all of this, chapters 1 through 11, the paradigm for all these exhortations is seen even right here. We begin to switch when we see this paradigm, which is total dedication of our lives to God because he is worthy. And that's what we see right in these two verses from today. Paul Johansson explains it that righteousness is practically manifested in the daily life of the believer. Uh, and, and he has also this, this uh, term I referred to the court case. I shared that with you. Uh, at this point, freedom has been declared on we who were guilty. And now, what does freedom look like for the life of the believer? What should our lives look like as those who have been liberated from sin and have new life in Christ? As Romans 6.11 says, so you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. What does being alive unto God look like? Well, Romans 12 through 15 answer this. But today's passage, Romans 12, 1 through 2, sets us up for what's coming through the rest of the chapter and to that point in chapter 15. And it says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and even perfect. There's some big concepts here in these verses, and I want to just talk a little bit about them, breaking them down by the words that they are. First of all, this word, therefore, therefore, I appeal to you, therefore, This is the third time we see the word therefore that Paul uses to make a transition of things that he's been talking about to the next thing. We saw it first in chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We also see it in chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Come on, hallelujah to that. And here in chapter 12, verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God. Of course, therefore, you ask, what's it there for, right? And we know that in, in light of all that has been presented up till this point regarding who we are in Christ and what he has done for us, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. 
These mercies of God certainly include his love, his grace, his righteousness that we mentioned uh, just a moment ago there and how he is bringing his righteousness and putting that on us when we don't deserve it, right? And he took on our sin. You see, it, it includes, these mercies include the gift of faith to believe. And, and Paul appeals to us by the mercies of God. And I want to just uh, point out another context uh, that you can't miss because it only comes a few verses before this in chapter 11. So if you're in Romans 12, uh, you just go up a little bit or back a little bit and you'll see uh, right here in verse 30 of chapter 11. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but have now received mercy, right? We were disobedient, but now we've received mercy because of their disobedience. So they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, this is speaking of the Jews here, uh, they may also now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. So we have received mercy and he wants to have this mercy on the Jews as well. But the point being here that these mercies, he appeals to us by the mercies of God. And what does he say? That you present, present your bodies, this temple that we live in. It's not mine. I mean, I think it is. I act like it is, but really it's unto him. It's unto him. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 14, there's a time when Moses and Joshua present themselves to the Lord. There's a transition of leadership happening. Moses is about to die. God tells him so. You and take Joshua, present yourselves before me. We see it again in 1 Samuel 10. There's a transition of leadership happening again to the first king of Israel, Saul. And there is a, there's a time of presenting, you see, oneself. Uh, Romans 6, verse 13 says this. Do not present your members, that's this body, to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Help me to be an instrument for righteousness. I present myself to you that way. So, so when we come to the Lord, he begins to change our lives. And you've seen this in, in many of your lives. I've seen it in my own. It's like I'm not going back to the places I used to go. I'm not going to do the actions or activities I used to do. I've been redeemed. I've been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ at the, the price of the heartache of the Father God who had to turn his back from him because he took on my sin. I've been purchased by his blood. So this is what he says, therefore, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, in the Old Testament, sacrifices that were offered, we see this from the book of Genesis, very beginning in chapter 3, all the way up until the time Christ died. When sacrifices were offered, once the sacrifice died, that's it. It was behind them in the past. Christ died, even when, as we see, once for all. He doesn't need to die again. He already did die, you see? Uh, so, so these offerings could not be offered yet again. But now we who are alive, we offer our sacrifice through what? Through our, our living. We who are alive because of Christ, it's our life that is the sacrifice. Not a dead sacrifice. Sometimes you get all, all depressed sometimes. You struggle with sin and you just lay yourself on the altar before God. Help me, help me, help me, ah. Are you there and you struggle with sin, anybody? Any believers in this place? Help me, Lord. And it's like, okay, that's good. Now get up and do something. <laughs> Meaning if that spirit of repentance and brokenness is good, but we have to come to the place of he doesn't need me as a dead sacrifice laying upon the altar. His blood has made things different and given me life that I can, yes, in a spirit of humility, and brokenness now live for him because of what he's done, because of who he is. He is worthy, you see? So, so this affects my living, my time, my resources, my daily decisions. 
Uh, am I submitted to God and, and to the promptings of the Holy Spirit throughout my daily life? He leads, he guides, he directs, he uses us for the glory of God. You know, I don't know about you, but I want to be used by God. I think it's a great cry of our hearts to say, Lord, I want to be used by you. And that can look different for every person, as it should, because there's only one Tony LaBarca, right? And there's only one of you, so he wants it to look different for you. And he'll use your gifts, he'll use your, your talents, your personality, he'll use all of that to express his own glory through you as the vessel. What a privilege we have. I want to be used as an instrument for his life, his love, his joy, his peace, his kindness to be expressed, his goodness, his light, his hope, the hope that I have in him, his healing and reconciliation. You see, may we be used by God in such ways. So I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Here I am, Lord. Use me today. Use me this day, Sunday, July 16th, and use me this week. Use me however you desire. Do we, do we give him that permission? Do we ask him to do that? I have to make that a conscious prayer, and I, wanna, I think that's what the Lord wants to bring us to, the place that we're making this a conscious daily prayer, especially as we begin to get into what's coming next, you know, from verses 3 and following in the next few chapters. We must place ourselves on the altar as a living sacrifice. Lord, here I am. Use me today to share your redeeming love, to tell of who you are, to tell of what you've done, to serve, to serve those who you lead me to, to strengthen those who are weak, to encourage them, to build them up. And you know what? You don't have to go far to do this necessarily. Often within your own family context, people that are very close to you, you may be single, there's probably people that live right around you, you can encourage them, you can strengthen them. You might be able to share your story with them, serve them. Do, just, just do, just be, and, and let his life come from you. And this is, he says, our spiritual worship. The offering of one's whole life to God, not merely going to church on Sunday. You came to church, right? We did it. I came too. You ever hear the stories of the pastor? He's in bed. He says, oh, I don't feel like going to church today. And and, and then the wife says, but you have to go. Besides, you're the pastor, you know. Sometimes we have days like that. But here we are. Here we are. We came to church. You tuned in online. Yay. But this is just the hour. It's, it's the other 167, right, that we want to. It's all our worship. It's all our worship. It's a life that's offered. Not just putting money in a plate or in the offering. or whatever. It's my whole being is being offered. Lord, I'm yours. My life, my time, my talent, my treasure, my resources, my strength, my days, all of me. This is the only appropriate response. So it is my spiritual worship or reasonable service, as some say, some versions. And then in verse 2, he says this, Do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world. Uh, one of my most practical resources that I used to use in preparing sermons, I pulled out uh, with uh, these, this verse for the word conformed. And that is my, I have a red Webster's Dictionary there, and I pull it out, and it's based on uh, the, I forget the dictionary it's based off, the Random House uh, or something like that from 1983, and there it is. Look it up. Conform. Listen to this. Five definitions. To act in accordance with a standard or norm. Now, the norm has changed very much in the last 40, 50 years, hasn't it? To act in accordance with a standard or norm. Two, to become similar in form or character. No, we, we cannot do that. Three, to be in harmony or accord with the world we live in. We're talking about here and even in the way we think. We are different. Four, to make similar in form or character. Five, to bring into harmony. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world. When I think of the word conform, I also think of other words that are very closely linked to it. Conformist, a person who conforms to a particular practice 
of a group or society. Conformity, correspondence in form or character. Compliance or acquiescence. That word compliance or comply, to act in accordance with requests and requirements, etc. I'll get into this in just a moment, but you're going to see how you live this out every day. Compliant or compliance or compliancy, the act of conforming and yielding readily to others. Complicit or complicity in partnership or involvement in wrongdoing. Right out of Webster's. Complicit, complicity in partnership or involvement in wrongdoing. I'm reminded here of Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. See, first we conform, then we begin to live in compliance with, and then we are complicit or in partnership or involvement in wrongdoing. This is where Paul is saying, do not be conformed to the world. I was speaking someone, with someone recently uh, who works in a clothing store, and, and, and uh, this scenario came up, right? And, and I'm sure many of you at work, you have this kind of thing happening all the time around you. Uh, they work they working in the women's department, and a man, he comes all the way over from the men's department, he's 30 years old or so, and he has men's clothes, and he wants to go into the women's room to get dressed. And this employee uh, looked at the man, and he, he acted as if, according to the employee, looking at me like a kid who was stealing a cookie out of a cookie jar or something and saying, what are you going to do about it? Because, of course, you know, in this place of employment, everything's posted on the walls of how we, you know, D-I-E, the uh, diversity inclusion and equity. You know, everything is we're going to embrace everybody except for the person who has the values that say, no, that is not right. Something is wrong. So what do you do if your daughters are getting changed in that changing room? Are you okay with this? What if grandma is in there getting changed? See, but now grandma's told she's wrong. The children are told they're wrong. The parents of the children are told they're wrong. And where we should be looking to protect the privacy of these women, these girls... Now we're seeking to what? Exploit? You cannot get in your head the, the, even the rationale, because there is none, other than that we want to live in sin. Absolute nonsense, you see. And we're effectively, could we be effectively approving it by our compliance? Are we being complicit? There's no reason for this to happen except to accept perversion as the new normal. Is that not the world we live in today? Not the world you live in? I'm here. It's nice and easy. I'm with Christians all day. We have different standards. But you, you, you cross the street, so to speak. You pull out of the driveway. Welcome to your world, you see. The Bible makes it clear this is not normal. It's not acceptable. It's perversion. And, and yet when we continue to allow such nonsense, I suppose, you know, to, to allow that, we, we, we're in some respects just saying, okay, we're going to become complicit in it. So this particular employee was struggling with, hmm, <laughs> Lord, what are you saying? And that's really what you need to come to, that place. Holy Spirit, what, what do you have me do? Do you wish me to remain here and be salt and light in a place that is clearly dark and embracing all this craziness around us? Or do you have other plans for me? Thursday night, Pastor Josh is sharing with the young adults, and one of the scriptures he read was from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and he says, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the things that you have been taught by us. And this is the type of thing that we're standing firm in, you see, because all of this onslaught, it's like waves crashing on the ocean, just one after the next, one after the next, and it can beat you down. All this worldly culture, the standards that are around us, and, and no, no, stand firm. Stand firm and hold to the things you've been taught by us. So, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. 
I was happy to stay in Webster's for the word transformed. Transformed means to change in form or structure, to change in condition, nature, or character. A synonym for this is the word metamorphos or convert. Convert. Interestingly, as Christians, we are to be converted, right? Converts. By the way, the Greek word here is the word, I'm not good with pronunciations, but it looks like metamorpho, P-H-O-O. I think it's metamorpho or o, something like that. Anyway, but it's the same word, this metamorphosis. Think so, here's a couple of examples, okay? Water, H2O, the element. It's gentle enough that you can drink from it. You can fill a pail of water and play in a sandbox with it, you see? Or it's powerful enough that when put under pressure, you can blow a hole through a cinder block like that. Or if that power can be harnessed like it is in Niagara Falls or just downstream from there, it can power a city. Probably half the state's power is coming from water. How about ice? Water, as we all know, at zero degrees Celsius becomes ice. It begins to freeze. And that ice can become from water, which is so not going to hurt anybody here. But ice can cause damage. Just drive around here in February and you'll find out what some of that damage is, right? Ice can be so powerful. Split rocks, bust up roadways, right? How about when it becomes steam or vapor through evaporation or through the heating process? Water becomes steam. It can expand 1,600 times. So, so if I have a few ounces here, the volume of this is whatever it is, 1,600 times this would be the volume of the steam. And of course, with pressure, it can be used to do great work such as run a ship like they did years ago, or a locomotive, or launch a fighter jet off a carrier, or, like you'll see down in New York City, it's used to power buildings. My friend used to work for Con Edison, retired from them. He's in, in uh, ministry now downstate. But uh, he's, Con Ed would do gas, would do electric, and then steam. And steam it was its own like division, and there are many places down there that are powered by steam. That steam is so powerful, it'll, it'll do all kinds of things. My father used to work down there in New York. He was an electrician, and he was talking to somebody about the steam there. This guy worked for, you know, in this particular building, and he said when he walked down the hall, he would take a, a stick, and he would do this in front of him. Here, here we go. I have a stick. I, I got to make sure because what happens with the steam, the steam, if there's a rupture, like a small pinhole in a steam pipe, and I walk through that, I won't even see it, and it'll cut me in half. It'll slice me in half. The power, the pressure. So they would walk with a stick because you wouldn't see that here, but maybe 40 feet away, you'd begin to see something. And if the, if the stick was good and it didn't get cut in half, I knew I was safe to walk through. You see? Different people have different jobs. Imagine that being part of your day. I just sit at a computer or, you know, whatever. I talk to people. Or... How about the butterfly? Here's another example. The butterfly is a simple enough concept to explain to a child. Each uh, fall, we'll have a releasing of butterflies with the kids, and it's really cool. And yet there's a profound spiritual truth as this word transformation or metamorphosis is seen. The caterpillar, representing the old self, begins to go into this chrysalis. Cocoon is made, and it stays there for a while, and out comes something that is better than was before. New life, new identity, clearly uh, can be used to show resurrection life. As the caterpillar goes in and dies, as if it were, comes out and is transformed and made better and more beautiful than before. You see, 
I am no longer who I once was. I'm a new creation in Christ. And some of us need to get that thinking in our being. I am not who I was, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, in a moment, but I am a new creation. I was thinking also, acorn or oak tree? I could hold an acorn in my hand, or you could see an oak tree outside. Well, inside the acorn is the oak tree. It's there. You just don't see it in its current form. It hasn't gone through the process of death in the ground and then springing up to new life. But the oak tree is in that acorn, and that's so it is for us. The potential of the new spiritual life that God has for us is in us. But when we die to self and let his life emerge, that's the key. That's the key for us as believers. So be transformed by the renewal of your what? Your mind or your thinking. God helps us change the way we think. God helps us replace lies and false beliefs, even about ourselves, with the truth. You might sit there and say, I'm just an acorn, I'm just an acorn, I'm just an acorn, or I'm just a, I'm just a caterpillar. And God says, no, 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 you're missing something. Because you're in Christ, you are a new creation. Think of these scriptures here. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The old Tony, the old you has passed away. The new has come. Think of this, Galatians 2, 20. I have been crucified with Christ. That is when he died, I died in him. I wasn't even born yet, but I died in him. You see? It's no longer I who live, because I also rose with him, hallelujah, but it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Talk about that love, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What kind of a better deal are you going to get than that? 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him, talking about Jesus, God made him to be sin who knew no sin. Jesus never sinned. So that why in him we might become the righteousness of God. Whoa. Talk about transformation. And I have to choose to believe God's word. God's truth, it's greater than my truth. My truth might say acorn. God's truth says oak tree. I might say caterpillar. God's truth says butterfly. Though that's probably more for the girls. They'd be more excited about being butterflies than guys would. Men will stick with the oak tree. Okay, but you get, you get what I'm saying here, right? I have things in my life that are not as though God would want them, but like, like God does, he calls the things that are not as though they are Romans 4 17 talking about Abraham I need to call the things that are not as though they are and that's where my confession is I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus so Romans 6 12 13 14 let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions do not present your members to sin I read this earlier as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been bought or brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. That's what these two verses are about. For, listen, sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law but under grace. God's truth trumps what I might think about myself. This is the process of sanctification through the Holy Spirit. And, and that was in there, too, in a couple of those verses that Pastor Josh was talking about the other night from 1 Peter and 2 Thessalonians. Jesus says it this way in his high priestly prayer in John 17. I don't ask that you would take them out of the world. He's going to the cross literally in a matter of hours. And he knows his time with them is very short. I don't ask, Father, that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. 
Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth, said by the living word himself. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And of course, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. This is what it means to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. And verse 2 goes on to say that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect, or what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, this word testing, it's used in different places uh, in the New Testament. Luke 14, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I must go to examine them or test them. 1 Corinthians 3, fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Same word. 2 Corinthians 8, a brother, to refer to a brother who was tested and found earnest in many, many matters. Tested. Now, when you look at testing, you can, uh, oh, this gets us into a couple of things. Testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now, I, ha- I have a um, handout in the back Uh, in the foyer, if you want to do a study on the will of God, because the will of God, there's a general will of God and a specific will of God. It's a great teaching. I won't take the time to get into it. I did a quick search, found something that's uh, available if you want a copy of it. There's about 15. If you need a copy and it's not there, just email me. We'll get it to you. Uh, It's just the front and back page of the general will of God, the specific will of God. You have to obey the general will of God. Then you figure out the specific will of God. Uh, That is for your life. But in general, how do I know if something is the will of God? I have to test it. I have to try it out. Uh, Let me say it to you this way. Uh, Linda hates going shopping with me when I want to buy a pair of shoes. I want to buy a pair of shoes, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sit there, and I'll try them on. Okay. This is good. Let's see. Years ago, you remember you had the salesman. He would help you. Now, now I don't know where that guy is. He's, uh, <laughs> you got to do it all yourself. He would go in the back and he'd get something. Now it's all, it's all right there, sir. That's it. That's all we got. Uh, do, do you have any? Nope, no, that's it. I don't know. Okay, whatever. Well, I, try it out. Get like these. These are like these, these boots. Um, but, you know, I think I ordered these online and you got to try them out at home. Well, you know, whatever. Okay. What if I don't like them? Then I got to ship them back. You know, it's just, times have changed. Okay. But, but I, I put the shoes on if I like them. Okay. I like the way it looks. I put it on. I stand up a bit. All right. I walk around the store a little bit. You see? How, how does this feel? How does this seem? I like the way it looks. I'm turning lights on because I'm walking around. I'm coming back to center. Okay. They, 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 that's what I do. And I have put on shoes where it's like, these are acceptable. They'll do. I have some shoes that aren't so comfortable, but they, maybe they look good. They don't feel great, right? I need them for a wedding. I need them for whatever. Or others that you put on, it's like, ooh, I like these. I like the look. I like the feel. I have a pair of these Keens that when I put these on my feet, it was like these are perfect. It's as if they, they snuck my foot into the, into the place where they make these things, and they said, we're going to make all these shoes for Tony's feet. I mean, I've literally put, you ever put shoes on that are like that? That's what I like. And they, it took me till I was in my 40s to find shoes like that, but they're out there. And they, this particular pair of Keens I had were exactly like that. See, so by testing, testing it out, right, you can discern the will of God, what's good, acceptable, and perfect. You see? Now, sometimes you just need a new pair of shoes, and you just got to do it, right? We all want the perfect will of God. I want the perfect will of God. That's what I want to live in all the time. Whenever I have a choice, I want it to be perfect. But sometimes good and acceptable can also be his will. You're looking for a job. I want the perfect will of God. Maybe you lost your job, or maybe whatever the circumstances are, you're in a new position, you want to just seek something different, you see? Well, I got my resume out there. I had five interviews. I'd really like this job from this company. I think it'll fit me perfect, but, but the only door that opens to you is door number four, let's just say. Ah. 
See, we want to try before we buy everything. But some things in life aren't quite like that. You can't try on your marriage before you get married, you see? We just test this out a little bit. Well, no, it doesn't work that way. Remember, the general will of God has to be obeyed before we get into the specifics. You see, can I try out the job? Well, often it doesn't work that way without difficulty. But you see, you will find and discover what God has for you as his perfect will, even if it seems just good and acceptable at times to you. All right, I'm wrapping this up here, and I just want to say this as we conclude. I guess the worship team can come on up. Am I living up to this? No, I'm not, if, if you need to know. And as I ask the question for all of us, I don't think we are. I think that's why God wants us to embrace this and, and start to get it as we look to these next coming you know, weeks in this series as we'll be looking at chapter 12, 13, 14, and into 15. Am I a living sacrifice? Here I am, Lord, every day. Use me to share your redeeming love to, to, and tell of what you've done for me, to serve those who are in need, who you place in my path, to strengthen those who are weak and need encouragement. Do I resist this sometimes, or do I just need to surrender and yield myself to the Lord? So what do we do in light of all this right now? I know of, uh, I've got two stories for you. The first is of a retired Air Force general. Uh, his son spoke here a couple of weeks ago, actually on these same two verses. He could have used this story himself, but he probably didn't want to talk about it because it was his father uh, and seemed like he was boasting. He did tell another great story, uh, though, in his message. Well, uh, this, this gentleman, 30, 30, probably five years in the Air Force, retires in his late 50s, maybe 60. And now he is, he is helping serve homeless people regularly. In fact, Steve said he's, every day he's, he's doing it. I like a full-time job, but he's just doing it to give. And when we were out there, I'll tell you what, you want to see homelessness on the West Coast, there's no way you could be a church and not have a ministry to homeless people. Uh, just everywhere, absolutely everywhere. And it's not like they're homeless entirely by, you know, the weather's decent enough. I think people just choose that this is their lifestyle. Can't tell you how many times you see it from a, often it's men, uh, but not always. Uh, anywhere from, you know, late teens, early 20s with a backpack on, up, up and through their 60s and such, you know, maybe 70 years old, the backpack. And you just, you just kind of, you start to see it after a while, what's going on. My wife and I were going into Walmart Young girl, I'm telling you right now, this girl, I thought she was the, my daughter's age, 15-ish. She, she says to me, uh, sir, you have any money? I just need to buy some food. After we uh, gave her a few bucks, Linda and I are just looking around at each other in this store like, what in the world are we even saying here? And uh, Linda ended up talking to her a little bit afterwards. We came out, did a little ministry tour there just to, just to ask what's happening. You want to hear their story, you see. What, what brought you to this place? Wound up, she's 22 years old, looks younger, but just what choices by yours or others got you to this point? You know, how, how so anyway, this uh, man, Steve's father, Randy, he, he's, he's doing it. He's serving, he's, he's unloading pallets. He's just, you know, behind the scenes to, to the point that the, the pastor of that church got wind of it. He said, uh, you know, who are you? What, what, are you, what are you? Well, I'm, 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 you know, Randy. How do you do this? You're retired? Well, yeah, I'm retired. Oh, well, what would you do for a living? Oh, I was in the Air Force. Well, what was your job? Well, I served and protected our country. No, no, I mean, what was your rank? Well, I was a major general. You see, do I need a title to be somebody? I'm the man. Forget that, please. Or is my life offered on the altar that I get to do this now? In his case, praise God. Good pension. He can do whatever he wants. But he's choosing to associate with the lowly. One more story. You'll read this if you do the daily bread. I read this a couple of weeks ago and just happened to flip to it. This is tomorrow's story. What's my purpose? I felt so useless, Harold said widowed and retired, kids 
busy with their own families, spending quiet afternoons watching shadows on the wall. He'd often tell his daughter, I'm old and I've had a full life. I have no purpose anymore. God could take me anytime. One afternoon, however, a conversation changed Harold's mind. My neighbor had some problems with his kids, so I prayed for him. Later, I shared the gospel with him. That's how I realized I still have a purpose. As long as there are people who haven't heard of Jesus, I must tell them about the Savior. When Howard responded to an everyday, ordinary encounter by sharing his faith, his neighbor's life was changed. You see, no matter what our age, background, or circumstances, we have a purpose. And that purpose is to tell others about Christ. Closes up, dear Jesus, open my eyes and my heart to people around me who need, who, who, who need to hear of your love. Please give me the opportunity to share the gospel with them. Father, today we just look to you with great thanks. You know, as we have been studying for these past six or so months, this incredible book of Romans, and as we transition into the way we should live because of what you have done for us, because of who you are. Lord, help us to offer ourselves as instruments of righteousness because you brought us back from death to life. We offer ourselves fresh. And, and I even ask God that you would help us with a spirit of repentance if we need to repent because we thought we were just living for ourselves. No, we want to live for you. And, and we want you to show us what that looks like daily. And I believe you're challenging us and, and setting us up, really. This, this is just the, the, the beginning of it. But as we get into it, you are going to be showing us things that are taking us to new levels. So today, July 17th, 16th, we set an altar right here. And we say, Father, change me change my heart attitude. I want to be used by you. I repent of just doing this life for me. Forgive me, even for filling it with things that are distractions that are less than your will. I want to be living intentionally, on purpose. I want my life to be a living sacrifice. And Lord, I pray that you would also help us to not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed and to see ourselves as a work of transformation by what? Your incredible, awesome grace. Lord, we pray that you will do this transformative work in us by the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And I ask even today, even right now, give us a thought. If it's to write in a journal, if it's to tell somebody, if it's to make a fresh commitment to you, whatever it be, right now, we choose to take action. I just want to invite you, if you feel the Holy Spirit impressing these truths upon your heart and you want to offer yourself afresh to Him, just stand to your feet. Lord, for those who have had the courage to stand, I pray that you will do a renewed work of the Holy Spirit in them. We want to be used by you. I think of people that will give their lives this week and be used almost like a, like a rag that you wring out. They'll feel wrung out at the end of each day. But there's such a great feeling in that, having given everything for you. And Lord, I pray for the supernatural strength because it's not in our own power but for the divine power of the Holy Spirit in each one of us. May we not do it in our own strength. Each day we commit ourselves fresh to you and say, Holy Spirit, fill me. Let it not be my strength, Tony LaBarca's strength, my cleverness, my, Lord, you have shown me so many times. Those things are just, they're, they're a joke. You use me in spite of me. But when you do it, it's always better than I could have ever planned. But Lord, I'm asking you, use me. We ask you this morning, use us for your glory. 
In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Praise God. The worship team has a song for us, and then we're actually going to take a moment to pray for summer's best. So you could just, well, I guess stand up. We're, we're going to get into worship, and then uh, we'll, we'll pray for our summer's besties, okay?